If you uh, have your Bibles, which I hope you do, please turn to the uh, book of uh, 1 John, chapter 4. I want to look at some things. I want to try to build. Oh, and my wife is going to tell me if I go too long, right? You didn't say anything last night. Didn't I go too long? I did. Oh, I ignored you. Well, you have to give me the, you know, jump up and down, spin around a few times. I'll either think you're telling me to be quiet or you're possessed. And I'll <laughs> but it will capture my attention. <laughs> Book of 1 John. Oh, by the way, I just, again, I want to say thank you, Pastor James. There you are. See, my glasses are for reading, so I can see that clearly, but I can't see any of you. So I'm all... But thank you again for your hospitality, having me here and my wife here. Um, we just, we've been having a great time really been having a great time. And all of you have been wonderful and terrific. I feel very much at home. Um, and I, I already can tell that I have an accent and I've only been here, what, two days, three days? So that must tell me I'm connecting with my people, okay? <laughs> so uh, so uh, anyways, First John chapter 4 at verse 8. Are we going to put that up there? Oh, great, fantastic. There it is. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. This is interesting because whenever we, what's interesting about uh, 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 this concept of love is you'll see this concept of love and this idea of love uh, thrown out a lot in our culture, in our day and age. Because uh, a lot of people will say things such as, well, if you are really loving, you won't judge. Or if you are loving, you won't criticize. You'll leave people alone to do whatever. Uh, um, and a lot of people like to throw that concept out is like, how can you Christians be against, say, homosexuality if you're really love? You, you know, you've got to accept it. Well, the Bible says that God is love. Yeah. So everything that God says comes out of love. Okay, that's one thing we, everything God does comes out of love because it doesn't say God has love. It says God is love. It's who and what he is. Now, the reason this is important is because as believers, we should never be swayed by the world's definition of what love is. We should be swayed and moved by what God's word is because if you want to know what love looks like, it looks like Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, whatever, 21. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. There's a lot of things in there that don't seem loving. No, there's a lot of things in there that might not seem loving by the world's standards, but never by God's standards. Because love propels us for the highest good. It, 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 it motivates us to bring about the highest good in people. So if you see people engaged in a certain lifestyle or action that brings them down to a lower state, though they may want it or not, it, it's irrelevant in that sense. Love comes in and says, wait, there's a better way. Yeah. See, love will confront the homosexuality on their sin, not because you're trying to hurt or crush them, but you're trying to bring them out of that sin to take them to a higher level. Right. Does that make sense? So, so it's unloving to not confront most of the time. And I, I hit this e even in my own family. I hit this with people all the time. Uh, uh, when I see people in addictions and I confront them on conditions, well, if you're really loving, you'd leave me alone. No, I'm really loving. That's why I'm confronting you because there is a better way to live. God has something so much more for you. I don't confront because I hate the person. I confront because I know they're living far below the standard that God has for them. Why do I preach the way I do? I wrote my book. I will warn you if you bought one or you're going to buy one. Um, I had a friend who read it, and he, he sent it back, and he said, this is salty. Now, I said, salty? That sounds really good. Then I looked it up in the dictionary, and salty means rude and, and harsh. I said, rude and harsh? Now I was offended, right? So uh, um, I said, salty, rude, harsh? I didn't think it was. I gave it uh, to another friend, and they, a, a gentleman in Mexico, and he wrote back, when you come back to Mexico, bring as many as you can, because I want to make sure this gets into every person's hand. Everybody must read this book. 
So I realized then and there that, you know, we're all going to look at things differently. So I can't be offended when somebody, somebody reads it and says, oh, it's too harsh. And another person reads it and says, this is great. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I just have to trust that it's going to get in the hands that God wants it into. So if you read it and think it's salty, that's okay. I'm not going to be offended. But if you read it and think it's great, that's okay too. I won't be offended at that. I just know that I, I will admit that for many, I can come off harsh because I'm very black and white. I'm very, you know, to the point, very direct, usually. Try to be nice when I'm out. My wife makes sure. The only reason she came is to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go just to make sure you don't say anything to embarrass me. <laughs> I'm throwing her under the bus. <laughs> Check the brakes while you're under there, too. Um, <laughs> but, but, but there's a reason why I've developed this. I wasn't always like this, was I, dear? Anyways, I don't think I was always like this. I just got to the point where I, I really got frustrated in, in not seeing people move ahead like I knew they could. And so it would just cause me to get just a little bit more blunt and to the point. Because I would still try to beat around the bush and be nice to people with a big smile on my face and they just wouldn't get it. Then I'd just pick up a two by four, smack them between the eyes and then they got it. It was really weird how that, how that, how that worked. So I enjoyed my two by four ministry. So um, I'm not gonna whack anybody with a two by four, that was just metaphorical. But if it seems like I get really direct, there is a purpose for it because I feel like we're coming into an era and a time, into an age where we don't have time to take the slow road. Okay, Paul made a statement, I buffet my body. We like to read it, I buffet my body. Okay, but in the original, it literally meant that he literally physically beat his body into subjection to the things of the Spirit. Okay, now, I wish it said, I buffet my body. Okay, because I love the buffet, but... It was, I buffet or I beat myself into submission. Now, I don't think he walked around physically hitting himself. Again, it was more metaphorical of the seriousness of, of putting the scripture uh, into pass in his life, walking it out. That when he learned something, he saw something, he immediately jumped on it to change himself to match what he just realized, the revelation that he just had. And think about, if you, if you think about Paul, where he, was, he started out as a Pharisee, he says these words of himself, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees with papers from the lead Jews to go round up Christians and imprison them. And he was even, when they stoned Stephen, he's the guy over there holding everybody's coats. You see, he was too pious of a Jew to pick up the stone himself, so he was somewhat of a hypocrite at that early stage of his life. So he just hold, held the coat, the clothing of everybody else that killed Stephen. So he was in full agreement of it. Then God hits him, sets him free, and changes him into another man. And now he's serving Christ. So you think that transition from the Pharisee of Pharisees that was out to destroy what this, this new sect of Judaism called the way, which was Christianity, now he's part of it and a lead apostle in it. His whole life changed. You, you have to understand, Paul did not take the slow road. He did not have 50 years to make an adjustment to this new way of life. He had to do it quick on the spot and it literally cost him his life and he's willing to lay down his life for what he believed. And then I meet many Christians, of course not you and I in this room, but I meet many Christians, well, you know, God's just working it out one day at a time. I'm thinking, well, can you get on with it? You know, um, um, I'm, it's like pushing a cart up a hill. Well, get in the buggy then. I mean, get in, you know, go get a pickup truck, something. But get moving faster because we're entering in a time and an era that things are going to speed up. So have you noticed that things have been speeding up? Yeah. Things that you, you used to think about before now is happening like almost on a daily basis. And, and, and so that means that God needs a people that will keep step with him and move along with him. So that we're going to have to really, really change on the fly and be able to shift and move. And when we receive a revelation, put it into our life and cause it to be a personal part of our personal culture very quickly, very fast, and without fussing. One of the things that frustrated me when, when my wife and I started out, we, um, we always did things somewhat differently. Um, not necessarily because we purposely did it. It was just the way God was moving on us. 
But the thing that frustrated me was when I had people come up, and it was not the new believers. I didn't have problems with the new believers because they were just getting trained. They just loved Jesus. And anything we taught them, they just ate it up and ran with it. But it was the people that had been around for a while. Why do you do things like that? we never done that before. That's not the, the way my church did it in the church I grew up in. And one guy finally did that to me, and he was my age. And this was literally about 15 years ago, so we were like eight years old. I mean, we're really young. And he would always say, well, that's not the way my old church used to do it. That's not the way my old church, that's not the song of my old church. I finally said, then go back to your old church. He got so much on my nerves, and he's and he says, what? I said, go back to your old church. If your old church was so great and you want this church to look like your old church, why are you here? Yeah. And he just literally, he did this and he walked away. <laughs> he came back the next Sunday, but I think it shook him a little bit, you know, but I was so frustrated of hearing that, you know, and the reason I'm telling you this is because just like back to the scripture where we see God is love, there's, there's this, God is re, uh, uh, renewing his definition of who he is Love, and he's giving a more pure definition. In other words, we are going to start seeing this God of love on levels we've never seen before, not according to what the culture or even the present culture of the church says, but what God says about himself. And not only that, but now we're, we're, the, the demand is being put upon us to do church the way God would have us do church, not necessarily the way we grew up with or the way the church down the street does. And it might, it might be a system and a way of doing church we've never known before. But we're going to have to be flexible and fluid enough to move with God so that he gets what he wants out of us. Because when he gets what he wants out of us, we are filled with joy and power. See, one of the things that I see in so many churches is so many churches have no life in them. And those are the same churches that you try to do one little thing different. Well, that's not the way we've done it before. And it's dried up and dead. Let's try something new. I'm not much of a farmer, but I know this. If you go plant a bunch of seed in a field and you don't get the crop and the harvest that you hope to get, you need to do something different next year, next season, next planting to get what you really want to do. If you keep doing the same thing over and over, according to Einstein, that's insanity. And if you keep doing the same thing, you will get the same results. But if you want different results, then we're going to have to be open to God. Say, God, then what do I need to change about me and the way I do things personally or as a church or as a family, as a community to get the results that we really want? I don't know about you. I am hungry for a move of God. Yeah. So, so think about this. Most, most every Christian I ever talked to or anywhere in the world will say, yeah, we want revival. So the question I have, and I even have this for myself, I was praying in this back there for myself, for my wife, or even our church back home. God, if what we were doing worked to get us to there, we would already have it, so where am I wrong? Right? You see, the wonderful thing about God is he allows you turns. If you realize you're going the wrong way, and it might be a beautiful drive, but if you realize this is not getting me to the revival that I know is burning in my heart. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You have to use your blinker first. Click. <laughs> okay. My wife always yells at me, use your blinker. Why? Then people know I'm coming. <laughs> Just like to surprise people. So anyways, so God is love. And in verse 16, uh, same chapter, 1 John 4, 16. Okay, there it is. <laughs> and we have known and believed the love that God has uh, uh, to us. God is love. Says it twice in this, in this chapter. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. If you live in love, dwell in love, you dwell in God. And again, we just have to have the correct definition of what love looks like and what love is. Because a lot of people, I, I worked with a guy. He was an ex-hippie. Um, and he had this tattoo on his arm, big tattoo of, of, of really colorful flowers and mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. And it said, and his name was Fraser. So, uh, um, so he had the phrase is love. 
Okay, now, now it was a, a cute little thing that he had, and people would say, you know, the phrase is love, because that was his name and everything, and he was about, you know, the hippie, peace, love, brown rice, and all that good stuff. But, um, but you know, his definition of love didn't quite match God's definition of love, because trust me, he was far from God. Believe me, he was far from God, okay? Um, and, and, and so we, we have to be able to re-evaluate not, you know, who God is, but through what does love look like, really look like? What does love really, truly, honestly look like? And how do we live that out? Because we can't honestly say we dwell in God if we're not dwelling in the, the kind of love that God is. It's like the word agape. If you were to look at this in the original language, those both words for love, verse 8 and verse 16, would be agape, if I'm saying it correctly, I hope. And what's so interesting about that word is it's found in only one other text of the time outside of the Bible. So basically, it was a word that, that Jesus himself pretty much invented, for the most part, or at least adopted, because that level of love is not like phileo, brotherly love, which is great, but it's this way. It's a love that's this way. Remember in John 3, 16, for God so loved, he agape the world that he did what? Gave. He gave that which was so precious to him. See, true love, the kind of love that God is and the kind of love that God expects from us is sacrificial. It means that when needed, you give that which is most dear to you. And that's what Jesus was trying to draw to this rich young ruler when he says, what must I do to obtain uh, eternal life? Go sell. He, he first said, keep the commandments. I've done this from a child. Then one thing you lack, go sell everything, give to the poor, and pick up your cross, follow me. And he went away sad. It says because he had many, uh, much wealth. Uh, uh, um, he was a very rich man. So Jesus knew the way for him to truly be able to follow him. And, 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 and we don't know whether he did or didn't. The story pretty much ends there. He may have went off and done it, sad, but done it, and didn't follow Jesus, but we don't know. But it ends right there. You see, there's something that God's going to require of all of us to give up, not just sacrificial of our, of our money or of other things, but give up even what we hold on to as dear. Like I said, the way we do church. Sometimes at home, I, I um, preach first and then we do praise and worship afterwards. And that doesn't seem like a big deal, and it really isn't. Preach first, do praise and worship after, instead of praise and worship and then preaching. But the very first time I did it, people had a struggle with it. You would have thought I committed heresy or blasphemy. Um, you know, I'm not saying everybody. Like I said, the people that, were, that have been saved, like first-generation Christians that got saved in our church, had no problem at all. They just, okay, let's do it. It was the people that have been around Christianity for a while. In other words, they have been so trained in their mind that there's this pattern that you do, and you must do it that way, or you're off somehow. And I said, that's fine if you can show it to me in Scripture. And isn't it weird? None of them could. And... and, and um, and so we did it like that, and we, now we do it, you know, often, not all the time, but often. And every time we do, I could see the people that are like, and it's the people that have been around. In other words, it's like a religious spirit that gets on us. Yeah. It's a spirit of religion that holds on to us and binds us and keeps us from really moving into the deeper things of the spirit because it doesn't want us to. Because if you got people of the spirit know this, the Spirit, as it says in, in, in John, blows where it wants. That's right. That's right. And you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. But people of the Spirit will just jump on board and go with it. I don't know where we're going, but we're having a good time getting there. There was a movie a long time ago I was watching where these guys were, they, they built this big old like wind sail kind of thing out in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and they were flying through the desert. And one guy says, by the way, where are we going? And he, the other guy yells back, I don't know, but we're having a fun time getting there. That's the people of the Spirit. We don't always know where we're going. Nobody knows what really God's going to do tomorrow. 
But if you're sensitive to him and you're on board and you're just flying with the spirit, you're going to have fun getting there. And when you get there and he starts moving, you're going to enjoy every moment of it. Every revival that I've ever studied, and I don't claim to be a historian on, on um, revivals, but I have learned that uh, every revival did not happen the way the people thought it would happen. So they had to be open to release from their own mind and their own thinking what they thought revival should look like so that God can truly move. And that's sometimes the hardest thing for us to do as believers is to really let go of our preconceived notions of what we think God looks like or the way we think he should move and just let him be God. I'll, I'll never forget when um, in our very first church building, um, we, I, I told everybody, now please, this is not a knock on your pews. I love pews. I grew up with pews. I slept in many pews as a child growing up. But we didn't have like a fellowship hall and things of that nature. We just had the sanctuary and a couple of kids' classrooms. So I told everybody, so when we get chairs, no pews because we need to be able to move them, you know, so we can move in tables, have uh, fellowships and lunches and everything like that. I said that one, that's why I had to qualify. I said that one time in the church with pews and the, they got mad at me. Oh, you're knocking our pews. I said, no, they're beautiful. They're wonderful. They, you can sleep on them much better than the chairs. I'm just saying, you know. Because I grew up in church, okay? And, and, and so, so I said, we just didn't have any room to have any, the, the sanctuary was for everything, you know, so we needed to be able to move around and everything. But the first moment I said that, somebody very close to me, I won't tell you who it was, but very close to me, no, it wasn't my wife, snapped back, red face, what do you mean we don't have pews? You've got to have pews in the church. I said, I'll tell you what. Find that in the Bible and I'll put pews in tomorrow. He couldn't find it. So we got chairs. <laughs> that easily stack. And we can move them out of the way. My point on just that is that's, that's just how silly sometimes we can become as human beings. Getting so stuck in, in something and it's really a religious spirit at work trying to dry up the move of the spirit. Does that make sense? Over silly little things. Now, I'm sharing this with you because I'm telling you, God's breaking out in this house. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yes. Okay? He's going to break out in this house one way or another because God has selected this place in South Carolina for his glory. Okay? And that's going to put a demand on you to move with him and be very fluid. Be like the wind, the spirit himself that can blow in and blow out where you're going, what you're doing, how you're getting there, who knows, but we're having a fun time getting there. You know, to, you know and, and I believe in starting on time. I believe you can start on time. But when you end, it really should be up to the Holy Spirit. Okay? And even really sometimes when you start. Um, there's been times where we start uh, our pre-service prayer and it just consumes everything and we just keep on going. The worship just keeps on going. You know, aren't you going to preach? Why? God's preaching a better message than I ever could. I have two favorite preachers in the world. First one is God. The second one, I won't tell you. No. Turn to uh, John 14. Uh, please, John 14. What did I do with my water? I know I had water. Oh, there it is. I forget. John 14. Now, that, that, that wasn't really in my notes except for the two scriptures, and I totally got off my notes, rabbit trail. Time, really, already? Five more minutes? Wow, my wife is yelling at me already. I better just go to my conclusion. And in conclusion, but that doesn't mean anything. I have eight conclusions usually at home. <laughs> keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. Because God is really doing something here, and, 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 you know, and I don't want to purposely take up time that I don't need to, but, but I also feel like you know, there's something that God needs to release. I don't even want to complain or, or, or um, say that I'm the guy that fully needs to, re, uh, to release it, because I know this. God does some extraordinary things. The Brownsville Revival, um, many people think Steve Hill came in and just released it, and that's what brought revival. The truth is, he was part of it, don't get me wrong, but he was like the cherry on top of the cake. They had been praying um, fervently for years for revival. 
and gearing up for revival. And God had been pre preparing them. And at the right time, at the right moment, Steve Hill came in and spoke, and it broke out on Father's Day. I forget the year, but on the Father's Day, and it really was the Father's Day. And, and uh, they had seven, eight years of revival because of that and through that. And now with uh, Kilpatrick is Nathan Morris and, and various ones. But you see, it isn't just that one speaker that comes in and brings it. It's they have to come into something already prepared. I can't bring you revival. You know, okay, one, only God can bring revival, but he brings it into what you have already been doing. The, the prayers, the praise, the worship, and that foundation that he builds through you. I can bring a portion of it, but not all of it. That's why I've had people call me, oh, you're a revivalist. And I said, please don't call me that. God's the revivalist. Okay. I just might be the, the voice that kind of connects the dots, and that's what I'm hope here to do. You are the ones that God's using to bring revival. Amen. Okay, because, you know, on uh, Tuesday, we get, get on a plane, we fly home. So if you want revival, guess what? You are the stewards of it. I'm just here to help in any way I possibly can, and I hope I am. Anyways, let me get back to this. John 14, Jesus said in verse 6, John 14, 6, we'll read 6 and 7. Oh, there, very good. Jesus saith unto them, or unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, this is something really interesting. Can you go to ver, uh, verse 7 as well? Let's read verse 7. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Why? Because they were looking at Jesus. See, Jesus... We, now, I read that God is love, and I started there for a reason, and then Jesus comes along and basically says in this thing that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because Jesus was the, the embodiment of love. He was the embodiment of the Father. He was the embodiment of love. Okay, so here's Jesus, and, and, and if you can get there real quick, John, go to John 1, uh, verse 1. So Jesus steps out on the scene, and he shows the world what God looks like by loving them the way God would. You see, and, and, and again, then, we, then if you want to know what love really looks like, study Jesus. Everything that he did, everything that he said, including his rebukes. Because in, I don't know about here, but in California on the West Coast, we got a big problem with people focusing on, on, only on the sweet Jesus. And they, and they miss the whole Jesus. Jesus would never say anything mean to everybody. Really? When I read it, at one point, he made a whip and flipped over tables, beat people up, and kicked them out of the temple. That's the Jesus I really like. I focus on that one a lot. He would get into the hypocrite's face and call them, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs. And in the day, that was, that was a very close to cursing at them for being such hypocrites. And they were religious leaders, which something you just didn't do. Jesus could do it because he was the leader of leaders, the king of kings. Yeah. He was there to not only love people and bring people up, but even to tear down those who were in their arrogance, leading people in foolishness. Yeah. And he, he squared off with them. That's why Paul even writes that all scriptures inspired of God, even to rebuke and reproof, right. not just to teach. And so we have this problem in the body of Christ. They focus on the, the sweet little Jesus, but not on, the, it's like they want to go continually back to the manger. And not go back to the man that walked among the people and corrected even the hypocrisy of the uh, Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. I mean, think about this. One of my favorite stories, only because it's so um, obscure in this sense. A woman follows Jesus and, and his disciples crying out, Jesus, my daughter is demon-possessed. Come and, and, and he ignores her. Now, does that fit into the plan or the idea of the sweet little Jesus? That he's ignoring this woman who's crying out, my daughter is severely possessed and tormented. He ignores her to the point that she gets on the nerves of the disciples and the disciples say, Jesus, just send her away. She's getting on her nerves. I'm paraphrasing, of course. 
And he just like, Shh. And then he finally stops and speaks to her. It's not right to throw, uh, uh, um, to, to, to throw the children's food to the little dogs. He called her and her daughter a little dog. Now, how many of you would still follow that Jesus if he turned around and called you a little dog? And this is the point I'm trying to make. This is where we have to stop being so thin-skinned in the body of Christ and being offended at every little thing because Jesus isn't always that sweet little baby Jesus in the manger that we can just coo over at Christmas time. He became a man and he's the son of the living God with all power and all authority. Whatever he says, we better listen even if it's an offense to us. And that woman chose not to be offended. She chose not to run away and cry. She chose not to be thin-skinned. But yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She had enough wisdom to know that one crumb from your table will set my daughter free. And she refused to be offended at the words of Jesus. And he said, woman, great is your faith. Do you realize that there's only two places Jesus said someone had great faith and neither of them were of the, of the commonwealth of Israel. Both were outside of Israel. They weren't the part of the covenant people. And you and I are not part of the covenant people in the sense that we are in a covenant with Jesus, don't get me wrong. But it, it, unless you are of Jewish heritage, I just got my DNA test done and I was hoping, man, I'm going to be like 99% like Jesus, you know. And guess what? There is nothing anywhere of me. I am so, I mean, you see the color of my skin? There is not any color in me anywhere. My DNA all came back from this little tiny little spot on the map right around Ireland, England, Wales, Scotland, right there. I'm like 100% white to the core. I am so white you could see through me. I was so disappointed because I wanted to be like Jesus' little brother. I wanted to just come back. You are Jesus' little brother, you know, and it didn't. <laughs> I was offended, but anyways, not at Jesus. But check this out. See, see, see so when, when God moves and he does things, not everything he does is going to feel good to our flesh, but everything he does is out of love. See, the God of love was walking around in the flesh and that God of love out of love and because of love and in love says, you're a little dog. Why was he saying that? There could be a million reasons. The scripture doesn't give it. But one of the reasons that's possible is he's putting her in check because of her false worship from where the group of people that she was from. But she even came back with a, a level of faith greater than the people that were in covenant. And she received fully what she came for. God didn't hold anything back from her because he, he saw she is choosing not to be offended. And the other time where we see great faith, where Jesus declares great faith is the centurion. Come and heal my, my, my servant. Jesus says, or, I will come. He says, no, you don't even have to come. Just speak the word because I too am a man uh, under authority. And he described the level of authority and how, a level, uh, how the authority works. So we see this, Sam this Samaritan woman saying that, that just one crumb from your table will set my daughter free. Great faith. You know, you're a man of authority and I understand of authority. And he says, great faith. All you got to do is speak. Great faith. You know, that's what I'm, I'm looking for. I'm not saying I'm there. I am looking for the day that I can walk in such authority because I understand authority. And, and, and here, do, you know, do you know why that story is so important? Not just because he said you have great faith, because when we see what great faith is and how to get there, it tells us what we must do to be there as well. Just like the, this little lady could not be offended at what seemingly was the harsh words of Jesus, we also have to understand that this man had great faith because he knew how to submit to those over him. And one of the things that's a problem in the body of Christ, um, at least where we're at in the big time, I hope not here, is people just do not know how to submit to their leaders. We have one young lady in the church. She actually now is our, our lead pastor. Her and her husband are lead pastors. And, and um, for years as she was coming up, she would call my wife sometimes five, six, seven times a day. 